Um, so now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Emma Martinez O'Brien, who is the Honorary Research Associate at the School of Historical and European Studies at La Trobe University in Melbourne. She was director of COASIT Italian Historical Society, 1987 through 1993, where she curated the National Bicentennial Exhibition, Australia's Italians, 1799 to 1988. And she also curated Bridging Two Worlds, Jews, Italians, and Carlton for the Museum of Victoria. She has been published widely on internments in Australia during World War II, including a chapter in The Great Mistakes of Australian History by the University of New South Wales Press and a chapter on internments from Innisville in a volume published by the National Museum of Australia. She also co-edited Italian Pioneers in the Innisville District, published in 2003, and Under Suspicion, a Citizenship and Internment in Australia during World War II, published in 2009. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome, a very warm welcome to Dr. Ilma Martinizio Brown. Thank you. to come here and speak to you today. My interest in internment has been lifelong on account of my family experience. But then not so long ago, I was offered five handwritten school books, which were a daily diary covering almost two years in Loveday internment camp. I couldn't, uh, I absolutely had to um, do something with them. And I'm going to speak briefly about internments from Sydney first, and then I'll speak about the diaries. The day after Italy declared war on the 11th of June 1940, police officers in all parts of Australia descended on Italians as they were going about their usual business, working in their offices, farms, market gardens and fruit shops and homes. These internments took place in what can be called the first phase of the war, when hostilities were mostly confined to Europe and the Middle East. Sydney received the brunt of this first wave of internments. The second phase, which included the Pacific War, had more serious consequences for those in North Queensland. This is when what is called the Great Roundup took place. At the start of the war, government policy was to intern relatively few Italians, in particular those who were regarded as community leaders, fascists or suspect, suspected troublemakers. As part of the surveillance of the Italian community, reports on individuals were gathered by local police and secret intelligence agents and lists were prepared across Australia. In Sydney, surveillance involved recording names mentioned in the Italo-Australian newspaper of those at attending Italian social functions and those reported at various festivities. Another method of surveillance involved taking down the number plates of cars par parked outside venues of Italian community social functions. On the 11th of June 1940, the day after Italy entered the war, Police swooped and interned 190 of Sydney's Italians. Now in this talk, I use the word Italians to refer to all those with Italian ancestry. When Italy entered the war, those who were not naturalised and therefore remained Italian citizens became enemy aliens. The Australian born and those who were naturalised were British subjects. Australian citizenship as a legal entity didn't exist until 1949. Now, Sydney was the centre of the Italian community in Australia and was the headquarters of the leading Italian importers, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, the Italo-Australian Shipping Company and many of the leading Italian businesses. The community included pros prosperous businessmen, intellectuals, artists and musicians, 
and many of the leaders were well integrated into wider Sydney society by marriage or by shared interests in music and the arts and by social activities like bushwalking, card playing, tennis and other sports. It was generally believed by intelligence of officials that all Italians had fascist sympathies. They did not distinguish between a sentimental attachment to Italy on the one hand and support for fascism on the other. There was a branch of the fascist party in Sydney which was quite active before the war and the members were included in the roundup on the first day. Although a few were committed fascists and supporters of Mussolini, others had taken party membership to facilitate business with Italy or to consolidate business contacts with the leaders of the Sydney community. Others joined to participate in social activities of the community. Some who were interned on that day were not members of the fascist party. One who was interned on the 11th of June 1940 was Italo Mafio Rossi, who was born in Australia and had never been to Italy. The authorities knew that Mafio Rossi was not a member of the fascist party. He was managing director of the Australian commercial company founded by his father. The main reason for his internment that he was deputy director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce. The, cha the chamber had been founded by his father in 1903 and his father remained director until his death in 1932 and then Mafio Rossi took the position of deputy director after his father's death. Another reason for his internment was that he had attended the social function in 1936, celebrating Italy's victory in the Abyssinian War. The fact that Rossi was Australian born did not prevent his internment. Similarly, many others, 64 in fact, of the 190 Sydney men who were interned on that first day were naturalised British subjects, so that legally they were not enemy aliens. Under the national security regulations by which internments were carried out, there was an administrative distinction between those classed as British subjects and those who were enemy aliens, although there was no difference in the actual treatment of those who were Australian-born, naturalised British subjects or, or Italian citizens. All those interned in Sydney on that first day were taken to Long Bay Jail and then, and then interned in Orange internment camp then sent to Hay Camp and finally to Loveday Camp 9, which opened in June 1941. <clears throat> Loveday was... Loveday was the largest internment camp in Australia, holding up to 6,000 men in six compounds per thousand each. The first to be established was Camp 9 in June 1941, containing mostly Italian community leaders, all the Italian doctors and leading businessmen, many from Sydney, uh, who returned early in the war. The second was Camp 10, housing Germans, Finns and a few Italians, followed by Camps 14, A, B, C and D. Camp 14A mostly held Italians, while 14B and C housed Japanese, and 14D had Italians, Australians, Germans, and various others. Camp 14A was the last to be constructed and was mostly for Italians from North Queensland. It was in Camp 14A Love Day that Mario Sardi's diary was written. In each camp, a leader was elected to represent the internees. The leader of Camp 9 was Prince. Alfonso Del Drago, who had come to Sydney in 1924. In the First World War, he fought with the Allies against Austria and was tried twice decorated for bravery and held the rank of major in the Italian army. He was interned because in Sydney he was president of the Italian Returned Servicemen's Association, the ex-combatente. Fifty members from this association usually marched with, on, in the Anzac Day march. He was also president of Sydney's Dante Alighieri Society and he occasionally gave lectures to members of the fascia. The intelligence officers in Love Day, while he was there, couldn't work out his political views because in treating the men under his control, he was, quote, 
just and fair to extremists, moderists, and anti-fascists alike. Also in Camp 9 was the elderly Dr. Fernand Bentivoglio, who was 69 when he was interned in 1940. Bentivoglio was naturalised in 1903 and had taught Italian at Sydney Conservatorium since 1920. He was a member of the Dante Alighieri Society and regularly presented lecture, lectures on cultural topics. His children had distinguished themselves, notably his daughter Marie, who was fir the first Australian woman to gain a doctorate. She received her D. Phil at Oxford in 1925, before doctorates were even awarded in Australia. To anyone. In Love Day, Bentivoglio's health declined, and from mid-1942, he was hospitalised. Because of his ill health, his release order was signed early in March 1942, and it was arranged for his son, Dr Enzo Bentivoglio, who was a doctor at Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, to escort his father home. Bentivoglio left Barmer Hospital by private am ambulance with his son on the 23rd of March 1943, but he died later that day in Adelaide. There were many gifted and talented men in Camp 9, and cultural activities of a high level took place. Painting classes were, con were conducted by Lamberto Iona, who among other accomplishments was a talented painter. Yonah was also a successful businessman. He was secretary of the Italian Chamber of Commerce, an importer and teacher at the Berlitz School of Languages. Yonah was very worried about what he would do to earn a living after he was released from internment, and he drew a sketch where he speculated that he would have to be out on the streets selling shoelaces to the passers-by to earn a living. Hardships were most keenly felt by the wives and children as their breadwinner was taken away and sometimes their businesses had to be closed and their home vacated. In Sydney, Italian fruit shops were targeted by rowdy gangs and with the menfolk taken away, shops had to be closed out of fear. Mrs Maria Paolani, who has written about her wartime experiences, lost both the family business and home when her husband was interned. In 1941, both Kate Stacey and Mary Molino, who were Australian born, were interned and sent to Tatura in Victoria where the women were held. Kate Stacey had for many years run the Women's Committee of the Fascio, which organised dances, card evenings and other social functions, and she attended to benevolent work within the community. Mary Molino was also involved in the Women's Committee and in the Italian school. Altogether, there were 855 interned from New South Wales during the war. The great majority, 624, were taken in 1940 in what I've called the first phase of the war. In 1941, only 40 were interned, but in 1942, an additional 191 were interned. Some were released after a few months, including Mafia Rossi, but the majority of the 1940 Sydney internees ended up in Camp 9 Loveday. They remained there until the eventual closure of Camp 9 and the transfer of those remaining to Camp 14D. Prince Del Dargo, who was the uh, camp leader of uh, Camp 9, was photographed uh, being the last man to leave Camp 9 when it was closed down in December 1943. There's a photograph of him at the War Memorial in Canberra being the last person out through the gates. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that the second phase of the war, after Japan's entry in December 1941, directly threatened Australia and deeply impacted on the Italians in Queensland. Resentment towards Italians in the northern sugar areas didn't begin with the war, but was long-standing. It was exacerbated by Italian ownership of land and cane farms. Economic envy and anti-Italian sentiment also expressed itself through the British Preference League. British Preference was a way of restricting Italian labour in the industry by reserving 75% of cane cutting jobs for Britishers. Ooh, what's that? 
Okay. By the end of February 1942, every man of Italian background in North Queensland had his port packed in anticipation of being taken away and interned down south. So many men were captured in a town like Innisfail that the local lockup couldn't hold them all, and they were herded into the local showgrounds where they were guarded at gunpoint by fellow citizens who were members of the local militia. These internments were effected not by an individual arrest warrant, but by a newly introduced innovation called a master warrant. A master warrant could list a hundred or more names. These master warrants came about at a time of some panic at the unfavourable developments in the war. In 1941, mid-41, after the fall of Greece and the deterioration of the war situation, authorities began an intensified surveillance of the North Queensland Italian communities. <coughs> this resulted in a report by the security service entitled Italian Penetration, which recommended severe measures against Italians, including those who were naturalised. Directions were issued to intelligence officers operating all along the Queensland coast to prepare lists for internment based on public sentiment against the non-internment of Italians. With the system of master warrants in place, the roundup of Italians began. In 1942, between January and June, 376 from Innisfale and 739 from Ingham were captured and taken away to internment camps, and similar numbers were taken from other northern towns. <clears throat> It will surprise you that in those four months in 1942, more people of Italian origin were returned from those two small towns of Innisfail and Ingham than from the whole of New South Wales for the whole of the war. My father was one of those interned from Innisfail, and Mario <coughs> Sardi was another. Mario Sardi was captured on the 14th of February 1942, captured is the official term used. While being driven to jail by the police, they passed his friend Giuseppe Grasso riding his bicycle. He was also captured and had to give his bike to a friend riding with him. They were imprisoned in the local lockup, which was crowded with other internees and surrounded by family and friends of those taken. <clears throat> After a few days in the crowded uh, local lockup, they were transferred to the Stewart Creek Jail in Townsville before being sent south to Loveday in South Australia. During the almost two years of his internment, Mario Sardi kept a daily diary, written in the five school notebooks that I mentioned, which I've recently published. Sardi's diary gives us a first-hand account of what camp life was like, life was like, and allows us to imagine the experience of internment, both for the internee and for the family affected. His story is set in Innisfail and Loveday, but the experience is shared by those from other towns and cities and other camps. Sadi was in the first intake into Camp 14A at Loveday, arriving on the 28th of February. The men were marched in from the railway station at Barmara, and the, the diary records the logistical details and difficulties of setting up camp from nothing in the heat, the wind and the storms of Loveday. It outlines the shortages of food at the beginning and describes conditions in the early days when the internees slept, slept in tents on the bare earth. Sadi tells of the tents becoming flooded and how the internees made themselves beds by liberating timber meant for camp construction. The camp was enclosed by perimeter wire fencing with perimeter lighting and guard towers six metres high. Camp rules outlined the daily routine from Revalli at 6.30 to, re to retreat or lights out at 10. The men were counted three times each day, sometimes more frequently, and there was a daily inspection of tents. The internal organisation of Camp 14A Love Day was delegated to representatives of the internees and was highly structured. Representatives were elected in theory but they were appointed and removed with the approval of the camp commandant. The first camp leader of 14A was Dr. Pisciatelli, who before his internment operate, operated the Italian hospital in Ingham. As well as camp leader, there were other organisational positions, from sectional leader to 
street leader to dormitory leader to hut leader to tent leader, all with responsibilities for the order, orderly management of the internees. Sadi was appointed as a hut leader at the end of 1942, and in this role he was responsible for ensuring the general tidiness of the dormitory, as well as, well as having control of the distribution of toilet paper and the division of blocks of surf. Another task was the allocation of razor blades and their collection and counting at the end of each week. Together with the issuing of writing paper, a new straw for mattresses and the allocation of fruit. Another duty was to count his men and report to the next level of responsibility. After protesting about the lack of food in the kitchen in the early days of his internment and, and concluding that it was provisioned in the Camorra way, Sadi then records his own Camorra work of secreting away a razor blade or two when the opportunity arose. Reading the diaries, we gain an insight into the attitudes of the internees to the injustice of their loss of liberty and their imprisonment. In, initially indignant and frustrated, they raised their spirits by singing Italian songs and anthems, but as time passed, those who didn't become depressed became resigned to making the best of the situation. The daily routines of camp life and what they did to pass the time are described in great detail. Saadi outlines their sporting activities, especially soccer and bocce, and their work of tidying the tents, growing vegetables to supplement rations, washing clothes, and occasionally peeling potatoes. Of the educational activities available, Saadi studied English and Italian. Other pastimes included playing practical jokes, making artefacts, and especially playing cards which took up a lot of time. Sadi records his games, the winners and losers, and how much gambling went on, although it was strictly forbidden, and punished by five days detention. Sadi broke this and other rules, but was never caught. A highlight of each day was the reading aloud of the heavily censored newspaper in the evening. After the newspaper reading, there were often poetry recitals, usually followed by music and singing. It was not unusual for the guards to join in the singing on special occasions. From time to time, theatrical plays were staged, sometimes in Sicilian dialect. Unlike Camp 9, 14A didn't have an outdoor theatre and performances had to be held in the mess hall. One of the most significant events that occurred in Camp 14A was the death of Francisco Fanton of Edmonton near Camp. Fanton was an anarchist and a, com and a committed anti-fascist. He was interned in Camp 14A in early March 1942. Then when a large group of described as fascists came from Western Australia to the camp in November 42, tensions between fascists and anti-fascists uh, grew and Fantin was killed by Cassotti, recently arrived from Western Australia. Saadi gave little information about Fantin's death, but he recorded a flurry of activity by the authorities after the death, as investigations and inquiries took place. Despite the close confines of the camp, no witnesses of the actual incident causing Fantin's death could be found. The coronial inquiry found Cassotti guilty of murder and he was committed for trial. He was found guilty of manslaughter on the 22nd of December and was sentenced to two years hard labour. Fanton's death indicates that the Australian authorities in interning a proclaimed anti-fascist who was devoted to fighting Italian fascism, not supporting it, were principally more, in, more, concerned, more interested in interning people according to race or ethnicity than allegiance or political views. Following Fantin's death, the military authorities were criticised for failure to segregate internees with, with opposing political uh, views, fascists and anti-fascist -fasc supporters. The camp commandant removed Dr. Piscitelli as camp leader after Fantin's death, and event eventually Eusebio Molochino, a businessman of Ingham, became the new camp leader. <laughs>
The young pharmacist, Alexander Rossi, who treated Sardi in the camp for a soccer in in injury, was working in the camp in Fermary when Fantin died, but Sardi doesn't mention this in the diary. Rossi had been interned a week after volunteering to join the Labour Corps in February 1942. Previously, he had made three applications to enlist in the Australian Army, Medical Corps and the Air Force. He was released after 18 months in Loveday and conscripted to the Aliens Construction Corps and sent to the Nullarbor Plain as a fettler on the railways. Eventually, after 12 months, the authorities allocated him to more congenial work as a medical orderly in Alice Springs. There are many examples of one member of a family being interned while other members were serving in the army. One was Loveday interning from, from Innisfail, Louis Masnada. Masnada and his two brothers, all three born in Australia, all enlisted in the army, Louis was captured when he returned home to Innisfail for the funeral of his father. On his release from internment, he re-enlisted in the army. <coughs> Australian-born Angelo Paban had two brothers in the Australian army. One of them, Tom, was posted to guard the prisoners at Cowra internment camp after his brother had been released from internment there. Another was Australian-born Mario Signorini, who had enlisted in the AIF but was discharged after a month because of flat, flat feet. Three weeks later, he was interned. The explicit display of loyalty to Australia by volunteering to serve in the army was not sufficient to, to prevent Signorini and others from being perceived as disloyal and a threat to national security. While Signorini was interned in Cowra, his father was in Loveday, 14A. Two other North Queenslanders who were Australian-born were actually serving in the army when they were captured. Both re-enlisted in the army when they were released. <clears throat> Another prominent Innisfail identity who was interned was Luigi Denisi, a well-known anti-fascist. Before the war, Denisi had engaged F.W. Patterson, the North Queensland communist barrister, to challenge British preference in the High Court, which he did unsuccessfully. This later became evidence of anti-British sentiment. In March 1942, Denise applied by letter to join the Volunteer Defence Corps, but he was interned at the beginning of May. In his dossier, he was described as a plausible and cunning type of Sicilian, when he was actually Tuscan. But this is Denise's macaroni factory in Innisfail actually supplied macaroni to the American troops stationed in Queensland, many of whom were Italo Americans. One of Sardi's frequently mentioned friends in Loveday was Frank Alio, who had volunteered for home defence in the same month as he was interned. While he was in, turn, in internment camp, his wife sold his grocery business and ran away to Brisbane with another man. <laughs> After the war and the divorce, Alio was able to establish another business and a new family. About a quarter of the Italian internees had become naturalised British subjects and others, like my father, were Australian-born British subjects. Including my father, there were 37 Australian-born Australian men of Italian ancestry who were interned. Almost all were from North Queensland and were taken in the first part of 1942. My father was local manager of the Shell Oil Company and his misfortune was that of the threatened Japanese invasion. He knew the location of the North Queensland petrol supplies. He was sent to Loveday to Camp 14D where he remained for 18 days before being sent back to Gaythorne, where he spent the rest of the three months until his release. After his release, he enlisted in the AIF, was in, discharged after a month and conscripted into the Allied, Allied Works Council. All he ever said about his internment was that they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Mario Sardi, before his internment, was a cane cutter. He was a simple and honest man who was not highly educated. 
Like a quarter of all the Italian internees, he was captured during the Great North Queensland Roundup. His dossier in the National Archives records the reasons given for his internment. They were a subscription to the Italian newspaper, which was pro-fascist, and 1938 correspondence regarding his subscription, which he signed with the fascist year date. Mario Sardi was also the victim of mistaken identity, being confused with Mario Sardi, who was born in 1903 and who lived in the Meridian area with his life with his wife. The other M. Sardi of Meridian was among Italians who wrote to the Italian consul in 1936 supporting the Abyssinian War. A later police report of the 15th of November 1941 realised that they had the wrong Sardi, but the mistake wasn't re rectified and a new and incorrect practice of bar dated 10th of February 1942 was used and four days later he was interred. In World War II, 8,099 Australian residents were interned, 1,914 of whom were rather arbitrarily counted as Germans, 4,855 as Italians, 1,141 were classed as Japanese, and there were 216 others. The authorities usually classified the internees into the three nationality groups of Italian, German and Japanese for administrative convenience, regardless of birthplace, citizenship or nationality. But among them were 1,591 British subjects, 452 of them Australian born. The two main waves of internment I've covered, that of New South Wales in 1940, were six, where 624 were interned, and that of Queensland in 1942, where there were 1,836 internments, accounted for more than half of all the resident civilians interned in Australia. Internment is therefore a recurring theme in the memory of these communities, as stories are passed down within families. In many cases, there is an added dimension to these memories, and people still ask why. The individual internment files, all in the archives, and the stories they tell offer an illustration of the working of policy and a glimpse of the mindset of the interning authorities. What is revealed, in particular in the files of the 1942 internments, is a random and haphazard collection of information largely comprised of gossip and hearsay, with little effort made to assess its accuracy. In many occasions, denunciations of disloyalty were made as a result of disputes or personal grudges, or economic en envy, or a generalised suspicion and dislike of Italians. There were two cases in Queensland where uh, a man was interned who owned a picture theatre and he wouldn't let the policeman in for free. <laughs> that might have been the only reason we don't know. Finally, the secrecy and refu refusal to disclose the evidence to the individual or to his solicitor, so that it remained unchallenged, greatly magnified both the personal and the public impact of internment. The consequences of internment were greater for some individuals than for others, yet despite the difficult treatment they received, many resumed their lives as best they could and many went on to make important contributions to Australia. The Saudi Diary, the first by an Italian internee to be published in English, is important in bringing, in bringing an almost forgotten episode of Australian history to a wider audience. Many, if not most, of the former internees chose not to talk much about their experience, so the book provides new understandings and explanations for those families whose loved ones were taken. But it also informs the general public about a largely unknown and forgotten aspect of the war. But the internment story has a much wider significance. The background behind the internments is fully recorded in the Australian archives for all to read, and it shows some of the prejudice that existed in the wider community against Italians and others at the time. It also shows that the response to the Italian-Australian presence 
was out of all proportion to any possible security risk posed by these immigrants and Australian-born British subjects. We have to remember it was a time of war and the authorities acted in what they, at the time, believed to be the national interest by placing national security above justice and individual rights. The internment story highlights one of the dilemmas of a democracy, a tension between individual rights on the one hand and national security interests on the other. By providing a close and personal account of the impact of wartime detention on the families and communities concerned, the book encourages reflection on the appropriate balance between the two basic principles of individual rights and security of the community. Thank you.